So we're very happy to welcome Dan Lansford from Texas AM and he's going to talk about matrix multiplication in Java. Well, I'm very happy to be here and thanks to Rob Lasher's talk for the invitation. So yeah, so this is going to be a story that kind of meanders all over the place, but it starts. Um so we have a technical problem here. Uh, you did something that I can solve this problem. So anyway, uh, the story starts in 1968 when Strassen uh, tried, decided to try to prove that the way we multiply matrices, oh, there it goes. So, yeah, like this row and column, I'm just going to do it on the board. Uh, so you have, um, you know, you go n, n, so there's um, n multiplications, n minus one additions, and you get that entry, and it's n squared entries. So you have to do roughly n cubed arithmetic operations to multiply two n by n matrices. And he decided in 1968 to try to prove that this is the best possible way to multiply matrices. So that seems a little too difficult. So we decided let's just do it for two by two matrices. But even that, of course, uh, is too difficult. So let's work over a field of two elements. And then you could actually enumerate all possible algorithms for multiplying two, two by two matrices. And <laughs> his, his project was a complete failure. <laughs> he came up with this. You don't need to look at this slide. The only thing you need to know is that there's only seven multiplications involved. There's extra additions, but let's not worry about that for the moment. So um, he also noticed that the entries of these matrices don't need to be numbers. They could themselves be matrices. Um, and so you can iterate it and use it on two to the k by two to the k matrices. And you use seven to the k multiplications instead of eight to the k. And then the additions increase slower. So you start getting a big payoff. Um, and basically, you can multiply n by n matrices on the order of n to the 2.81 arithmetic operations instead of three. So he proved that, or is it checked in this case? He proved that, well, if you have two to the k by two to the k matrix, if you have an n by n matrix, you take the closest. Two to the k, and that will that the, the remaining bits oh, that you need to use is lower order terms. So who cares? Okay. I mean, he, no, you know, computer science, it's just that big O, the rest, they don't matter. Okay. And, but actually, though, physically, this is more efficient on a physical computer as soon as the size of the matrices are about 2,000. There's an overhead cost. That you have to wait to make these or that, but these days that's not unheard of. 2000 by 2000 and instruction basis. Okay, then of course, the you know, once somebody figures this out, everybody starts working on the problem. And over a 20 year period, they gradually lowered it to on the order of n to the 2.37, whatever arithmetic operations. I point out though that these other results, some of these are just existence results. They're not practical algorithms. And then at some point around that era, they made this astounding conjecture that as your matrices get larger, it becomes almost as easy to multiply them as it is to add them together. That is, you can get as close to n squared as you want if you're willing to deal with very, very big matrices. And then, but something funny happened, nothing happened. So there was like spectacular progress and nothing happened. And then little, you know, a whole bunch of people all at once run it down like that last decimal point. So seven, 2.375, 2.373, and uh, that's about it. Okay. So um, this is a, I'm a geometer, so I want to think about this problem geometrically. And actually, when I started working on it, my goal was to dis disprove this conjecture or something because it sounded like a ridiculous conjecture to me. But um, maybe nowadays I don't have that opinion anymore. Uh, I don't have any opinion. 
But let's, okay, let's get mathematical. So matrix multiplication, each of matrix, each of second matrix, spits out a third. It's a bilinear map, linear in each factor. And um, in a more um, geometrical, you get more symmetry if you view your bilinear map as a trilinear form, something that eats three matrices and spits out a number. And um, so matrix multiplication sits in this threefold tensor product. And um, if you get bored during this talk, you can prove that the associated trilinear map eats three matrices and spits out the trace of their product. Any questions? Okay. There, are, there are a lot of trilinear maps. That's right. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So um, I want to uh, Give a, give a geometric way of counting the number of multiplications or number of arithmetic operations. So a trilinear map or tensor has rank one if it's, well, a matrix has rank one if it's a column vector times a row vector times a column, column vector times a row vector. This is like a column vector, a row vector, and a vector spinning out of the board. Um, that's rank one tensor. And um, these correspond to bilinear maps that can be computed with one scale multiplication. Now, in general, the rank of a tensor is the smallest R, such that you can write it as a sum of R rank one tensors. And it's essentially the number of scalar multiplications you need, which basically governs the complexity of evaluating the map in an optimal algorithm. And Strassen proved that. He said that this tensor rank, this geometric quantity, is a valid way of measuring the complexity of the matrix multiplication operator. So let's um, introduce some terminology. Let's take the infimum of the growth with respect to n, of the exponent of the growth, call it the exponent of matrix multiplication. So with this new language, this classical algorithm shows that it's at most three, Strassen shows that it's most 2.81, and the standard conjecture is that it is two. Can you just, what's the letter R? So it stays in my head. This gold R? Yeah. So that is the rank of a tensor. So R of a tensor is its rank. So it's the number of rank one elements you need to express it. Other questions? R for rank. Yeah, that's what that, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about this conjecture geometrically. So um, the set of tensors of rank one is some subset in this gigantic n cube dimensional space of tensors. So you should envision it like a curve in some very large space if you want. Of course, it's larger dimensional than that. It's like three, three n, but three n in an n cube dimensional space, it might as well be a curve. Okay, and then what does it mean? Well, the curve corresponds to rank one thing. Yeah, well, the curve is the set of all rank one tensors. Of course, it's, it's, it's really of dimension 3n, roughly, but if we're in a space of n cubed, 3n is a pretty tiny number. So, um, so, so, so that's the set of rank tensors of rank one. Now, a tensor of rank at most two is a sum of two tensors of rank one. So it lies on a secant line to the set of tensors of rank one. And so this conjecture is about a point. So matrix multiplication is some point in this gigantic n cube dimensional space. And it lies, we want to know whether it lies on a secant R plane to the set of tensors of rank one, where R is something that grows you know, in the correct way with respect to n. So, so with that in mind, we have a, a space. We have a, ge a geometric object, and we want to know, it, and we have this point, and we want to know, you know, what's the smallest R such that there's a R secant plane to our set that this point lies on. Okay, so let's go back to the history. This is uh, one of my favorite parts of the history. So, um, Pini, Capovani, Lotti, Romani. We're trying to see if two by two matrix multiplication with one entry setting to zero 
to be computed with five multiplications instead of the naive six. So the reason they wanted to do that is because if that were true, they could build a bigger matrix multiplication tensor that beat, would beat Strauss and out. And they were using numerical methods. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that this reduced tensor had bracket five. And um, they were using numerical methods in 1979. So that was less sophisticated than now. Um, and they wrote some code. And the code appeared to have a problem. It was very strange. So I actually met Feeney. And it was great talking with him because he got so passionate when he was telling me this story um, how he could not sleep at night because of the problem with their code. So here's what was going on. The code was, they start at some random point, random sum of five tensors and try and converge it to this um, tensor they want, this degenerated matrix multiplication tensor. And what would happen is they could, they kept on getting closer and closer and closer to it. But then all of a sudden, the coefficients would blow up and the, everything would fall apart. And he's like, what is wrong with my code? And I, he went through it over and over again because it just didn't make sense to him. And then suddenly one night, he realized there was no problem at all. You see, we teach our calculus students that if you take a limit of secant lines, you get a tangent line. And that's a different kind of object. And so he coined a new terminology. The border rank of a tensor is the smallest r, such that your tensor is, it may not have rank r, but it's a limit of tensors of rank r. So that point there, it doesn't lie on a secant line, but it's a limit. It's a limit of tensors that do lie on secant lines. And so this is, this is great because the algebraic genres in the room are very happy now. Um, and he also showed that this border rank is a, also a legitimate measure of complexity. So we can use that instead. And if you do algebraic geometry, you're very happy. Is it the tangent bundle of that thing? No, no, no. So, so, uh, so, okay, in the language of algebraic geometry, we're looking at the secant varieties of the rank one tensors. Um, the things we were looking at before we're on the interior of the secant variety, and now we're going to include the points on the boundary of it. But everything is, all the action is taking place in this n cube dimensional space. We're not doing any bundles or anything. Well, if you, the pronoun it in your question is replaced by the tangent bundle. Is the set of points you add the tangent bundle? Yes. Right. You said yes, yeah, those. With embedded tangent. Lines. But that's just for two secants. I mean, yeah. 12 oh, secants. Well, yeah, there's very fancy. Things that get added in. Oh, right. The boundary is very complicated. It's some kind of jet. It's more complicated than that. Jet secant. Yeah, it's jets and secants. So it's, it has a rich geometric structure, which we'll discuss okay. later, maybe, but not right now. Um, yeah. I just spent a second quickly explaining what the relationship between the secant and Yeah, the so, so if, you, if you teach calculus, you know. You know, you do this, you know, one over h, do whatever, and then if this h has to go, h goes off to, to zero, right? So this, this number is going off, and then there's some other number here that's growing very big, and that's how you get to take a derivative, just in old fashioned calculus. And so that was, that's what was going on with this code. So it's converging to that point on the tangent line. But that cannot be written as a point on a secant line, but it's you know epsilon close to one. Yeah, so this this thing, this curve represents the three n minus three dimensional space of tensors of rank one. And this point here is a point that is a tensor that probably has rank three, but it has border rank two because it's a limit. Of points on a secant line. So if I, I have a line right very close to that, all right. 
to the to the seat count. What, what rank do they tend to set on the seat count? So so here, so just imagine I take this point X and this point Y and I move it to this point here. This point here will move, and when it's when these two points touch each other, this one here will no longer be on a seat count line if we're in a large dimensional space in general. So, so what's the question? What is the rank of the dentist on this uh, line? Oh, that is not clear. Um, it's not obvious. But in, 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 the, in this particular case of, of, of sensors, it will be three for a general for a general point B, but you're not, it doesn't necessarily need to be three. But that's 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 a subtle population that you cannot see from the picture. I mean, if that point is a limit of, of a secant line that passes through just two points, right, then the rank cannot be more than two. Right? No, the rank is three. In but, I, but you said any if you can write it as a combination of two rank one things. Right, but this is not a combination of two rank one things. Thing. This is a limit of such. That's a difference between the rank and the quarter. Rank. So this is a rank at least three, and it's a, a limit of rank. It's a limit of rank two things, but it can have rank three. Yes, it's not rank is not semi-continuous. This is what Bini rediscovered, and they, he was finally able to sleep again at night. All right, are we all on the same page now? All right. So, and this is a good complexity measure, which makes me happy. All right. I'm going to take a detour because, because of this conversation. I anticipated this conversation. When we deal with matrices, we have this fundamental theorem of linear algebra that says row rank equals column rank, that says matrix rank is semi continuous, all kinds of things. All these things are false for tensors, and it's normal. For those things to be false. What I claim is no matter what geometric object you put here, usually if you have a small geometric object in a large ambient space, there will be points on a secant line that are not on a tangent line. But for matrices, this is false. If you have something that's a limit of some of two rank one matrices, it itself will have rank at most two. And um, so just to say in another language, if you have a curve like this, or most geometric objects, points will lie on just one secant line. And if they lie on a secant line, they do, usually do not lie on a tangent line. So if they're on a tangent line, they usually do not, I should have said, if they lie on a tangent line, they usually do not lie on a secant line. Would have been the correct pedagogic way to say. But if you have like a plane curve, then, of course, any, every point lies on everything. And so rank, rank one matrices have this property. So they're extremely pathological because they're like curves in a plane, except they live in some gigantic ambient space. Yet they have this very peculiar property. And if you were at my talk yesterday, there's very few algebraic varieties that have this property in large co-dimension. Okay, so let's um, introduce a little bit more geometry. So um, I'm going to do a projective space because the problems I care about are invariant under each scaling. And I'm going to talk, my sets are going to be defined by polynomial equations, home to zero sets of homogeneous polynomials. Such so objects are called projective varieties. But just think of the set of border rank at most seven tensors. And um, in our case, the ambient space is this thing. Our variety is old, it's been studied for over 100 years, it has a name, the same rank variety, but for us it's just a set of rank one tensors. And I'm going to stratify my ambient space by a sequence of these things, where sigma r is the set of points that lie on some r secant plane, or that lie on a limit of r secant planes, and this is called the variety of C, the secant, r secant variety of x. And these have been studied for over 100 years. And in fact, 
If someone had asked him in 1911, Terracini, who, has a, who developed a way to calculate the dimensions of these things, could have predicted Strawson's discovery. Because if you take any bilinear map from C4 cross C4 to C4, it will lie on the seven C cap variety because that fills out the ambient space. So even you write down the nastiest four, four, four tensor you can think of, it's still going to be um, either to be written as a sum of seven rank one or a limit of such. Okay. So how does that 63 relate to four cubed? Oh, I see that's. 63 is four times four times four minus one. <laughs> All right. So let's let um, notation sigma r be these things we're interested in, the set of tensors of border rank of those r. And I want to disprove this conjecture. So how am I going to do that? Easy. Find a polynomial that is in the ideal of this thing. That is to say, a polynomial that if it eats a tensor that has border rank at most r, I get zero. So I look for such a polynomial, and then I test it on matrix multiplication, and I show that that polynomial is not zero on the matrix multiplication tensor. And that would be a proof that the matrix multiplication tensor has border rank strictly greater than r. Well, how am I going to find that polynomial? Well, first of all, before that, I should say it was a little, well, maybe it's kind of embarrassing. It wasn't even, I thought this was embarrassing. It wasn't even known for a two by two matrix multiplication. So for two by two, we would need equations. We, wanted, we would want to disprove six. Can you explain that again, the logic of you want a polynomial? I couldn't follow it. Okay. So I have this point and I have this set. I have a point and some set. And I want to show this point does not belong to this set. So I find a polynomial that if I take any point in this set, I get zero. What's the set? The rank R thing? This is, yeah, this is the tensors of rank, order rank at most R. And this is my matrix multiplication tensor. And I want to show that this is not inside here. But this set is covered, cut out by polynomials. So I find one of those polynomials in the ideal. And then I um, evaluate, and, and if I have good luck, when I evaluate it here, I get something not equal to zero. And then it proves that this point is not on this set. Sorry, Jan, just, just to, because I think, I can't remember what, how MN is described inside this set. Can you just quickly remind me? So, so M N is C N squared tensor C N squared tensor C N squared, and as a trilinear map, it eats three matrices. A couple tips. That's equivalent to the bilinear map we started with. But in any case, the, the principle in general doesn't matter what what point in what set. This is just general technique for separating some can I understand? Else. So what he's trying to say is that then anything in there has a rank, you want to write it as is some of you know vector tensor vector tensor vector, and that rank is how many multiplications you need to multiply matrices. Right. No, I got that. Okay. And now he's trying to prove right. that it's not in the rank R set. Yeah, so, I, so in, in this case, I would want to show that this two by two is not in the border rank of those six set. So, so I would need a polynomial. Vanishing on all tensors of order rank at most six that did not vanish on this. Well, that's the part I didn't understand. But you asked the second question before you finished answering my first question. Oh, sorry. So can you no? He did. No, not you. Can you just explain it again. You were in the midst of explaining it. I didn't get it. Okay. I understand the setup. I just want to know. You want a polynomial? That what? I want a polynomial in the ideal of this algebraic variety. Such that oh, this vanity. point is not in the zero set. Yeah, I think so. And that was proved that this point is not in this oh, algebraic variety. Okay. okay. It's a certification of non membership. Thank so, you. yeah, so computer scientists I've learned are really, really clever, but they have difficulty proving lower bounds. In fact, there's a classic text by Aurora and Barack. It's like the main, you know, 
complexity theory test text <laughs> you know chapter 14 is called lower bounds complexity theories waterloo and they basically go on to say that they don't know how to prove any lower bounds at all for that chapter okay now i thought it was easy i thought it'd be easy and why did i think it would be easy to find this polynomial because we have representation theory to help us. So what is representation theory? It's the systematic study of symmetry in linear algebra in a nutshell. So for example, if I take the matrices of rank R, rank at most R, so zero set of size R plus one minors, tensors, oh, I'm mixing two subjects. The headline is a little off. So let me just tell you sort of by analogy, some other situations. So a matrix has border rank or border rank at most R um, if all the size R plus one minors of the matrix are zero. And it turns out that for tensors, for border rank at most one, it's the same kind of thing. You just pretend your three-way tensor is a lopsided matrix and take the two by two minors of that lopsided matrix and you do those in three different ways. And that'll give you enough equations. Now, it also turns out that a tensor has border rank at most two. It is the zero set of degree three polynomials, but not just the three by three minors, there's some other ones as well. Now, now I'm getting to what I wanted to talk about. Representation theory gives me a systematic way to search for polynomials. So I, maybe I should say a little bit more. So we have the group of change of variables in this vector space, let's call it A for Alice, B for Bob, C for Charlie, we got three vector spaces. I can make arbitrary change of bases here, arbitrary change of bases here, arbitrary change of bases here, and that will leave this set invariant. And so the ideal of this variety, the set of all polynomials vanishing on this variety is invariant under the change of bases in each of those three vector spaces. That's a large group. And that means I can organize the space of all polynomials. I can decompose it under the action of this large group. So here your group would be GLN. Well, well, let me, it's GLN squared. No, it's G. Uh, so it, let's call this thing M. And so I have GLM plus GLM plus GLM because matrix, I'm not talking about matrix multiplication. No. I'm just talking about the sigma R. This group is that variety invariant. Therefore, its ideal will be preserved too. So I look at all homogeneous polynomials of some given degree, and I can decompose it under the action of the group. And in representation theory, there's something called highest weight vectors. So you can just test on the highest weight vectors uh, and a random point to your variety, and that'll work. And so, um, with my. Because it's a reductive group. So yes. Yes, <laughs> it's a very nice group. Um, so I, I, I wrote many papers with the whole many though. And together, we're, we're not so good with computers, but we got some help. And with the help of computers, we were able to prove that there were no polynomials in the ideal here of degree less than 12, which got us a little depressed. And in fact, I think that caused uh, Laurent to stop working on this problem after that he gave up. But I persisted. What number would you have liked? I, well, when I first started working on this problem, I was hoping for seven. But that turned out to be very naive. <laughs> and then, like, you know, a few years later, I had some wonderful postdocs I was working with, and they really know how to work with computers. And they upgraded to show that even in degree 19, 18, there's still nothing, no polynomial that vanishes on this. Right. So these two by two matrices are n by n. These are six. No, this is, there's no, forget about matrices. This I is our ambient space is C4 tensor. Okay, C4 okay. tensor C4. C4, it's not C9. And so the full ambient space is dimension six to four. Does the degree have anything to do with whether or not you're going to capture that ambient? Well, it's just we worked, we started with degree seven, that didn't work, then we went to degree eight, 
Looking so we're looking for the smallest polynomial we can find. We're cheap, right? Um, right, but we won in degree 19, but the degree 19 polynomials were so complicated, we could not, we could only prove it numerically, not symbolically. So it wasn't a real proof. But the good news is in degree 20, there was an easier polynomial because it corresponded to a trivial representation. And with that, we finally got the original proof that I thought I could get in three months. Uh, it took me much longer than that, 10 years, uh, to, to prove that, in fact, it's not in this sixth one. It is really sort of outside of that, and you can't beat Strassen even approximately. Um, earlier, using differential geometric methods, I had a different proof, but that, that, that different proof is, is kind of, uh, has no hope of going anywhere. Okay, so. See, did this search, I want to read this page, like, will solve the problem if you, in other words, this search will, will answer the problem in the beginning. So if there's, if there's, there's, there's two, two okay, there's the small problem of just resolving the first open case. And I, we did it. Actually, I did it twice. Now, now multiple times, but let's not worry about that. So, and then there is the hope of studying the general problem, which is going to be much more difficult because that's an asymptotic problem. But first, let's do the first few cases to understand what two by two matrices look like, what three by three matrices look like. So, the, 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 is the conjecture, the conjecture was wrong? No, there, there's no conjecture involved because the conjecture is asymptotic. And this is just the first case. So that the theorem can just say it says you can't do better than Strauss. Yes, even, even approximately. If you're gonna get a result that has to be asymptotic. This is true, but no, if you if you want to prove or disprove the conjecture, you have to work asymptotically. But let's start more modestly. They also wanted to understand these small cases. And even the first case they didn't understand. And it was posed as open problem, you know, for, you know, since 1979. So it took a while to get solved. Not that, I mean, not that. Okay, so let me tell you, um, so what's the statement of this finite problem we're solving? Yes, the statement is that um, this border rank of this two by two matrix multiplication tensor is greater than six. And therefore, it equals seven because seven is the largest to compute. Okay, so um, let me tell you since since the systematic way seems doomed because we're already in the simplest possible case we're dealing with very complicated polynomials. Let's try and work uh, more geometrically. So now remember that a matrix is rank at most R, all of its R plus one plus by R plus one minus zero. And this tensor one, well, uh, if that's, that's not true, let's say it, so let's ignore that. So this gives, the, that's not an intermediate statement. It has, it has more than one than or if there exists a non-zero size of this typo. Um, and this is only giving us weak bounds because in- What is Latin's name? Um, this, so I pretend my three-way tensor is actually just a matrix, so I'm putting parentheses. So we flatten it down from a three-dimensional object to a lopsided matrix. It's not my terminology. Okay, so there's a, a classical idea in algebraic geometry, determinantal equations, and um, let me explain it in kind of low brow method. So you have your vector space. This is our vector space. And we want to find polynomials on this vector space. So we're going to embed this vector space into a large space of matrices. So for example, I took with Octaviani, we found this large space of matrices was particularly good. Um, uh, so we call this Kazool flattening. Algebraic jumpers will know why. Um, so I have this set of, say, n by n by n tensors, and then I pick my favorite number p, 
like p equals two, and I put it in this large space of matrices. Okay. Um, don't worry how I do it. If you know, you can guess. Otherwise, don't worry. And then you take minors in this large auxiliary space. And uh, yeah, we call those physical flattenings. And uh, let me tell you, so Strawson previously uh, did something like that, although in different language. And he was able to prove the first non-trivial lower bound in general, that it's at least three halves n squared. Uh, so that was in 1983. And then his student improved the error term. And then uh, a long time went by with no further progress, almost 30 years. And then using that trick I put on the board earlier, we were able to uh, change this three halves to a two. So, um, yeah. So just to, you know, for people who know, I, so in, in the first thing you learn in representation theory is Shor's law. So we looked for a, 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 G, a, a G map from this space to some large space of matrices. And you can systematically do that. We're just looking for uh, modules for this group, tensor product of two modules for this group, such that this space is a submodule. <clears throat> And the punchline is we found equations by exploiting the symmetry of this geometric object signal line. Okay, and now some bad news. This bad news was found almost simultaneously um, by algebraic geometers and by complexity theorists in completely different language. So those first four names are algebraic geometers and the second four names are complexity theorists. And basically the game is almost over. Uh, so for the experts, uh, the Hilbert scheme of zero dimensional schemes of length R is not irreducible for R greater than 13. I'll leave that. Uh, anybody want to correct me? No, okay. We don't have any uh, zero dimensional scheme experts here. It's actually already false for R equals eight. But um, my schemes are Gorenstein, so I get to go up to 13. So, determinantal methods in this language. What does it mean the game is almost over? Uh, it means that if we want to do this trick I was doing before, we're not going to do much better than we did already. Um, so, this trick, which I'm calling determinantal methods, is not going to work. And for the experts, I'll just put down one slide. The um, object we're interested in in the language of schemes are zero dimensional smoothable schemes. And there's this other object that is just points on spans of zero dimensional schemes of length R. And the determinantal methods detect that other object, not the object we want. So this, this one sits inside this one. And when R gets large, it's just a tiny little piece of it. So, for example, uh, the border rank of a tensor can be or something like m cubed over three, where these are m by m by m tensors, but the cactus rank can be at most six cents. So, this is a barrier. We got to get completely new techniques if we want to go further. Is, so, do I understand? Does that mean that the group that you're using is not exploiting enough symmetry at sigma r? Is that what you're saying? No. We, as researchers, are not exploiting the group enough. The group has, has plenty more to tell us, and it will later on in this talk, but just using this classical method, it's done. But we're going to go beyond classical methods, hopefully. Okay, so before I do that, I point out that we were focused on this thing, and our tensor could have been any tensor. It just happens to be matrix multiplication, but it could have been anything. And we didn't exploit the fact that we're dealing with a very special tensor. In fact, our tensor also has its own symmetry group, a smaller symmetry group. So given any tensor, you can define its symmetry group to be the changes of bases that preserve it. And uh, the symmetry group of matrix multiplication 
which has to sit inside here, which is the, the triple. Um, this is n squared, n squared, n squared. This is n, n, n. So three n by n matrices sit inside a triple of n squared by n squared by n squared matrices, and they preserve our tensor. And the proof is one line, the trace of like the action of the, this group is, you know, I multiply my first matrix by G1 and my last matrix on the right by G1 inverse. And if I take the trace like this, you can see G2 and G2 inverse cancel, G3 and G3 inverse cancel. You remember the trace is cyclically invariant, so you can make G1 and G1 inverse cancel. All right. So how are we going to exploit the symmetry group of our matrix multiplication tensor? Well, if a tensor has border rank R, there's a curve of R planes in the Grassmannian, and these are the R planes span by the R points that are going to limit whose, whose, whose span limits to something containing the tensor. And so at T not equal to zero, this R plane is span by rank one elements. And at time zero, our point is in the limiting R plane. Now, if my tensor has symmetry, I can take this curve and hit it with an element of the group, and I still get something that works because T will not be moved by the group. So even if everybody else is moved, the, the new thing, the new E0 will also continue to. So using that, Mikhalik and I proved that you can insist on curves that are normalized. Those uh, which are Borel fixed. So the Borel subgroup inside of a group is just the upper triangular matrices. So triples of n by n upper triangular matrices. And using that, we're able to squeeze, kill off the error term a little bit. So before with Ottaviani, there was an n, and now it's a log n. But this is not going to go much further either. So yeah, I have to say, when we proved this, I was really depressed because we like really worked hard and then we knew we could not do anything more than this. This was the limit of all the methods. And we felt like it was kind of a Pyrrhic victory. But it turned out that this idea has, um, yeah, so let's go on and see. So now um, we go to Poland, the Paczynski family, um, had the idea to, let's, let's, you know, they're, you know, I'm a, I'm a differential geometer by training, but they're, you know, algebraic geometers, they know what they're doing. So, um, you know, in modern algebraic geometry, you don't look at your geometric object, you look at its ideal. And so we're not going to just look at the curve of our points, but the curve of ideals defined by those R points. So at each time T, we have a set of R points. <laughs> and we should look at a set of polynomials that are zero, evaluate to zero in those R points. This gives it the border apolarity method. And so if our tensor is a limit, then um, we have this ideal at each time. And well, we'd like to consider the limiting ideal. But how to take limits? How can we take a limit of an ideal? So I think all the algebraic geometers in the room know the wrong answer. <coughs> What's, the wrong answer? What's the answer an algebraic geometer would give? The flat limit. Right. Or another way to, well, where's the limit taking place? So the algebraic geometer would say the Hilbert scheme, but that's the wrong place. Because the, um, Limit of the span need not equal the span of the limits. So um, we have to we deal with unsaturated ideals in this business. And so we have to work in this fancier um, thing called the Heyman Sturmfeld's multi graded Hilbert scheme. And this thing lives in a product of Gross line. And now we have a limiting ideal, and you only need the ideal at a few degrees. That's why it's just a product of Gross line, it's another infinite product. Um, you can insist that your limiting ideal is fixed by that same Borel subgroup. That is to say, in each multi-degree, 
you had an R plane or a codimension R plane, and you could put each of these in a normalized position simultaneously. So that's what I was saying. Degree coming from. Well, see, this is you should take these as polynomials in three sets of variables. Yeah. Because okay. because I, I have a point, you know, good, you got it? All right. Right. So the upshot produces an all normalized candidate ideals, or there are none, and you've proven that the border rank is strictly greater than one. And because it's an ideal, there's these compatibility conditions that these things, different R planes must satisfy. Questions? Okay, I know this is a lot to take in, but I'll summarize it in a minute. All right, but well, yeah, so let me just summarize it now, I guess, because I'm not going to say anything more about it. So the point is, we're going to use the group more than before uh, to study these secant varieties by um, not just looking at one R plane, but by looking at a bunch of R planes in the space of polynomials. And so you get an infinite number a priori, but it's determined by the first, say, 100 of them or whatever. And so this gives us a lot more information to play with. All right. So right off the top, you get a proof that you can write down by hand of this result about two by two matrices. Um, now, for three by three matrices, Strassen had proved 14, the Batanyana had proved 15, with Michalak, we proved 16, and now with this thing, we proved at least 17. So, so far, there's only among matrix multiplication tensors, this is the only one in this order right now. So. Now we can also consider rectangular matrix multiplication, where I multiply a two by two matrix by a two by three matrix. And this is just as important as the square ones. I just focus on the square because that's the easiest to write down. But so we determined this case, um, the uh, upper bound was known and we proved that the lower bound matches the upper bound. Same in this case. And um, this is all like really just was unheard of, you know, a few years ago. And then we have some asymptotic results. And this is important for several reasons. So the first reason is previous to this result, this is a very lopsided tensor. This is a tensor of size 2n by n squared by 2n. So one of the vector spaces is much, much, much bigger than the other two. And previously, there were no results on unbalanced vector spaces that were non-trivial. So n squared would be trivial. And this is we add on this linear term. So it's modest result, but it's the first result ever in an unbalanced case. So for example, and similarly, this unbalanced case. And previously, only like near trivial bounds were known. Is there a conjecture, an asymptotic conjecture for R, let's say 2 and N? Uh, I, I have one, but I, it's not that I say it in public. Um, but yeah, I think I could maybe conjecture something precise there, but not in, not in this we're being taped. Maybe it's there. And um, this is also good for other tensors with symmetry. Uh, so, for example, you can consider the three by three determinant polynomial as a tensor, and we determined its border rank. Okay. Now, as happy as that may be, um, we're really still not um, distinguishing between smoothable and non smoothable schemes. This whole machinery um, is also subject to the barrier that I was talking about. But, it gives us a path to overcome it. So first of all, we augmented uh, the method in ways that potentially are avoiding the, the, the barrier. We don't know yet. Um, but we did get additional results with our augmentations. And one of them is very important if you're in complexity theory, 
this was this was posed as an open question in 1988 by the computer scientists. I don't have time to explain why I care about this three by three permanent, but just trust me that they do. And it was known that it was either on 15 or 16, and we proved it was 16. Uh, this is with my current um, postdoc, Amy Huang, and Austin Connor, who's my former student, he's now at Harvard. And so, yeah, so for those of you who've heard the words, it's important for Strassen's laser. Oh, I said that already. Okay. So the main challenge remaining is, so why did we solve three by three matrix multiplication? Because it produced a candidate ideal of border rank 17. But we don't know whether this ideal is, is actually a limit or it's an imposter. It's just an artifact of our construction. It just passed all the necessary requirements to be a candidate, but we don't have a certification of sufficiency. And so um, in this type of situation, when you have some degenerate object and you want to see if you can get at it from a sequence of less degenerate objects, there's a whole gigantic machine in algebraic geometry to do this for you called deformation theory. Actually, I spent the last two years of my life trying to learn deformation theory. It was not pleasant. Um, so in, in particular, it allows one to determine if an ideal is a limit of ideals of speed states. And um, very recently, I talked about it yesterday with my student, Arpan Pal and Joachim Yosea. Um, we did a small example of this uh, that actually, it works. So it works in a small example, and now we're trying to scale it up efficiently. And I hope that uh, I'll have like even more exciting news to report to you in the near future. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? So uh, at what point did you implicitly or explicitly use the associative law for multiplication matrices? So for 90% of this talk, the, the multiplication of matrices was kind of secondary. What we were really talking about was understanding this, this, this um, tensors of order rank R. And only in hindsight, did the fact that matrix multiplication is the thing I care about show up? Um, the only thing, the only time I actually used anything at all about matrix multiplication was that it has this symmetry group. That's the only, only time. So that's why this determinant polynomial has a large or has a large symmetry group. And so the methods work with that. So the methods don't really care about this thing in particular. They just care. What is that thing? What? What is that thing? This thing is the symmetry group of our tensor. So in general, if I have a tensor T. Uh, so, the tensor? Mm -hmm. so the tensor in our three vector spaces and a tensor inside that should define its symmetry group as this G1, G2, G3, and GLA plus GLB plus GLC times G such as G does nothing to my tensor. And Everything I talked about today mostly focuses on properties of this variety. And any tensor where this group is large, the methods will work for. It just so happens that the computer scientists care about this matrix multiplication tensor. So we applied it to that tensor. 
but we're very happy to apply it to any tensor that you care about if it has a symmetry group. There's really the rank of any tensor in terms of the symmetry group. Yes. Well, the main thing is this variety, but then to apply this new method, your tensor has to have a symmetry group, and then we take a Borel subgroup of that symmetry group, and then we can you know, crush it into some tiny corner. And your goal is to show that this tensor is not in sigma r. Is that well, correct? So these days I'm working, you know, I, I've been in this thing for so long, I kind of work from both sides now. So actually, um, tomorrow I'm going to talk with some guy at Columbia who's like the world record holder for the, for the upper bound. And I'm going to try and help him prove better upper bounds using algebraic geometry as well. But that's a completely but different talk. You talk about here, but today's right? talk is all about lower bounds. But it's about finding a polynomial that, that vanishes on sigma r but does not vanish. That's how it started out. But we realized that our ability to do that is too limited. That technique is not efficiently implementable asymptotically. So we had to try other techniques. And this other technique of working in the Hennenstern-Fels Hilbert scheme and these normalized points in these Grossmannians is working very well. But the most important thing about it is it, it advanced the subject, but it also gave us a path because you can't use deformation theory unless you're in a space where you can do deformation theory. And now that we're in some kind of Hilbert scheme, we have the tools of deformation theory available to us. Previously, the subject was too primitive and we didn't have tools for doing something like that. But in terms of these Grassmannians, you're saying you're not using polynomials, you're using objects adapted to the Grassmannians to show that that guy is not in the other guy. That's correct. And what we hope to do next is we have some candidates to determine if these candidates are real or whether they're imposters. And we hope to do that using deformation theory. And we successfully did that in a toy example. And now we're trying to upgrade it. This is this is this is this is a, a point in a product of rust models. And this point determines an ideal. And we want to know if this ideal is a limit of good ideal. And that's what deformation theory is going to tell us. But we now have a very small list of points to check. And we have to determine if they're imposters or not. And if they're not imposters, deformation theory will give you the algorithm as well. The active matrix multiplication and the bounds that, are, that one has, are they? Uh... Practical. Strassen's is practical. None of the others are. That was 2.81. Okay. Yeah. So if you have 4,000 by 4,000 matrices, you can multiply them on the IBM mainframe because it's hardwired into it using Strassen, and you will save a lot. So there's a research by Ballard and Demel that actually they're like really, really implement these algorithms, and they, you know, tell you exactly how much you're going to save. And even on which computer, they do it on different computers and tell you how to save on different computers, all kinds of stuff. Sorry. No, because, I mean, a thousand cubes is a billion, right? I think that's where computers are, what? One billion, 10 billion, something. No, but it's a thousand squared times a thousand squared times a thousand squared. No, it's a thousand squared times a thousand squared. And then the output is a thousand square, but then the tensor space. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but the algorithm is eating the ten thousand, ten thousand. But for a lot of applications, you must not be multiplying general matrices. Right, right but you know, sessions. for a lot of applications, you are. Really? General yeah. And, and 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 the people who are doing the scary applications where they have matrices a million by a million. Inside there, there will be an unstructured core. Say it'll be really sparse, but really with respect to a million. And there's still some 4,000 by 4,000 unstructured matrix inside there that needs to be multiplied, even if you even if you do your tricks. So even for those very sparse matrices, this can give you a savings when they're enormous and sparse. And they do deal with those enormous and sparse matrices. 
Well, they is not me. I am not one of them. Well, suppose it's not sparse. How big can it be? The matrix from the fastest computer today? I do not know. But I do know that they can deal with matrices of size 4,000, and they can multiply and morph it efficiently with Strassen than without. And I would refer you to this um, Ballard demo paper for like exactly what they can do as of five years ago, which is probably obsolete. But. So 4,000 rows we can do now. Was that I'm sure of, because that's in that paper. And they tell you how long it took them. Does it take seconds or minutes or hours? I don't remember. It's still going. <laughs> I mean, I'm a theoretician. It's terrible, you know. I, it's embarrassing that I don't remember these things, but I, I don't know. She knows you know. I can't remember anything. So it's not like these are the things I don't remember. I don't know that. <laughs> And on this pedagogical high note, thank you, Aaron, again.